Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Before we start with our today's analysis, a quick gentle reminder. Baiju's exam prep IAS has already launched its official Telegram channel. If you have not yet joined the channel, please do join so that you get all the current affairs related updates. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article says, CMs must be consulted for appointing, removing governors, says DMK MP. Let us try and understand what is this article all about. This article here is speaking about the powers of the governor. This article here is speaking about the grey areas with respect to the executive powers that have been given to the governor. When it comes to the relationship between the governor and the state government, what we have seen in the past few days is a constant tussle between the state government as well as the governor. Let's take the example of Tamil Nadu or let's take the example of Telangana or let's take the example of Kerala. What we have is a constant misunderstanding between the state legislature and the governor. In order to address all these issues, the grey area of the powers of the governor, what we have is the DMK MP who has come up with a constitutional amendment bill and this happens to be a private member's bill. So the first question is, what is this private member's bill? If there is a bill which is introduced by a parliamentarian who is not a minister is called as a private member's bill. This means if he is not a minister in the cabinet, if any other person, even if the person is from the same political party which is represented in the parliament, such is what is called as private member's bill. So a parliamentarian who is not a minister, if he goes about presenting a bill, that is what is called as the private member's bill. Currently, when you look at the governor, there are some grey areas which the opposition political parties also feel will have to be addressed. Who is making the appointment? It is the president. Who is making the removal? It is the president. So it is in this particular backdrop, the president means the party which is in power, the cabinet. So the appointment process, the removal process, everything is happening on the pleasure of the president. This is where the political parties have an issue. If there is a governor who has to be removed or appointed, a consultation will have to be made with the chief minister and many other provisions are part of this private member's bill. Let us try and understand what are the key provisions as mentioned under this private member's bill. The first is in reference to the appointment, stating that the bill is meant to clear certain grey areas in the constitution regarding the powers of the governor, including the powers of the gubernatorial pleasure. He said that the centre should consult the respective chief minister of a state before appointing a governor. What does this mean? This means that whenever the central government is appointing one of the governors to the state, let's say the central government that is the president is appointing one of the governors to the state of Tamil Nadu or to the state of Kerala or any other state for that matter. Whenever such person is being appointed, please consult the chief minister of the relevant state. Why? Because it is the governor and the chief minister should have a good relationship and it is during this particular period, there should be no harm to the legislative business if there is a consent given by the chief minister. If you have already taken the consultation with the chief minister, there will be no skirmishes and tussles between these two constitutional bodies. So this article currently goes on to say that whenever you are appointing the governor, have a pre-appointment consultation so that this could reduce the friction between the governor and the cabinet and ultimately what we will have is a much better legislative business. So to reduce this friction and to ensure that the business of the state happens without any issues, what you have to do is make sure that you have a pre appointment consultation. This is the first major provision introduced under this particular private member's bill. The second is about the eligibility. The bill suggests amendments to Article 157 so that no person shall be eligible for appointment as a governor 
unless they are an eminent personality in some walk of life the person shall be disqualified for appointment as governor if they have attained the age of 75 years or have been in the employment of the union or state government or any union or state owned undertaking or body or corporation or agency or any local authority in the preceding 10 years added to it if they have been constantly with the government they are part of the political party let's say they have been a minister in the past whether it is in the central government or in the state government or they have been judges in some of the higher courts it can be the high court or the supreme court such people should not be allowed or entertained to be part of the governor is another recommendation so basically if they have been the office bearer of some of the registered political party or there have been some criminal charges placed on that particular person or they have been actively engaged in the politics these people would not be able to remain neutral they will become the mouthpieces of some of the political parties that they represent so if there are two different political parties one at the center one at the state what these governors will do they will wear two hats one for the state government the other for the central government but then they would not be neutral they would be the mouthpieces of the party which is at the center this should not happen so if you are appointing the governor he should be a neutral person a person of eminence who does not have any connection to the political party added to it if he has any criminal charges such person should also not be advised to become the governor of a state this also goes on to say that if there are judges in the high court or in the supreme court even they should not be provided such a position of governor in the state the third is with respect to the removal it adds that a governor may be removed from office before the expiry of his term by the president on the recommendations of the chief minister currently the chief minister may recommend but there is no such obligation that the president will have to remove the governor but this bill goes on to say that if the chief minister so decides he makes the recommendation to the president the president should also consider it Arya, there is no such provision because it is at the pleasure of the president president means it is the union cabinet but now there is a recommendation in this legislation being made so that if chief minister is not happy and there is constant interference by the governor and there is friction between in these two constitutional bodies if the chief minister so recommends please remove the governor is the third recommendation cooling off period what do we mean by cooling off period let's say for example we have a bureaucrat or let's say for example we have a judge let's say the bureaucrat is working for the government up till the age of 60 years or a supreme court judge is working for the supreme court up till the age of 65 years so after 60 years let's say for about two years or three years this person should not be given any executive positions and if it is the judge the judge should also not be given any executive role for about two to three years five years so on and so forth so cooling off period means that immediately after your retirement happens that person should not be given any executive responsibility for a certain period of time the bill seeks a 10 year cooling off period for anyone who has been a political party member government or corporate employee a member of parliament or an assembly or a minister to become a governor so once the retirement or this person is removed from one of the designated role for the next 10 years he should not be appointed as the governor of a respective state finally the person who has become the governor cannot go on to become the mp the bill says that if a person has even been a governor of a state he or she shall be disqualified from becoming a member of either house of the parliament all these provisions clearly depict what are the criterion that have to be drawn so that the governor's appointment process, removal process, eligibility process is clear and there is no interference or frictional points between the governor 
as well as the cabinet at the state level. Now let's look at recommendations that have been made in the past. We have one of the important commissions that was appointed back in the year 1983 called as the Sarkaria Commission. The Sarkaria Commission was asked to advise and give recommendations with respect to the constitutional changes and also about the office of the governor. What did the Sarkaria Commission say? The Sarkaria Commission examined the centre-state relations. It also looked at various issues between the governor as well as the cabinet. It felt the chief minister should be consulted before appointing the governor for the proper working of the parliamentary system. So the Sarkaria Commission back in the year 1983, which was appointed to examine the relationship or the center state issue points went on to say that CM has to be consulted, chief minister has to be consulted and only then an appointment should be made, said the Sarkaria Commission. We had the National Commission to review the working of the constitution. It was appointed back in the year 2000 and this commission went on to say that whenever an appointment of the governor is to be made, what we require is a committee. This particular committee will require a body of people which will have the Prime Minister, which will have the Home Minister, the Speaker of the Lok Sabha and the Chief Minister of the relevant states. So this is another recommendation that is made by the National Commission to review the working of the Constitution. But this is where there is a small issue. What is this issue? When you speak about Prime Minister, Home Minister and Speaker, they are the persons who belong to the Union government. We have the Chief Minister. If the Chief Minister is directly inquired about the recommendation to be made for the appointment of the Governor, we know for the fact that the Governor is far superior in terms of the hierarchy when it comes to the state level. So this person Governor is at the mercy of the Chief Minister so in the near future, because the chief minister has been given this consultation, there is the responsibility or this person may have to reciprocate to the viewpoints of the chief minister. We have the governor primarily because he is acting as a constitutional head. In case there is anything wrong against the constitution, he should question the state cabinet and the state legislature. But if the consultation is with respect to the chief minister, then this person, the governor who is appointed, may at times not question the chief minister because he is at the mercy of the chief minister. That is one of the other points that have been put out as well. So the governor cannot be made to feel that the chief minister was the one who was responsible for a selection. The governor has to be about the chief minister, be independent, be able to function in a non-partition manner and ultimately needs to question the legislature, the cabinet and the chief minister if need so be to maintain and sustain the ethos and principles of the constitution. So it is in this particular backdrop, all the grey areas, yes, will have to be addressed. And what we require is a clear cut legal mandate and structure is what is this article all about. Now let's look into the next article. This article says, why a price cap on Russian oil? Let us try and understand what is this article all about. We have Russia, which is one of the countries which has the largest reserves of oil. When it comes to Russia, it makes a lot of exports of oil. And this is what is one of the backbones of its economy. Russia sells oil. It also sells natural gas. It makes exports to number of countries. And with the money that it receives, it is able to run its economy. But of late, what we have is a major war that has happened between Russia as well as Ukraine. Russia invaded Ukraine and as a result, there were large-scale human rights violations. The international order was disturbed in order to teach Russia a lesson. What we have is the Western powers, that is the G7 countries which came up together and they came up with what is called as the price cap on the Russian oil. So what is this cap on the Russian oil? Let's take an example, a hypothetical one. Let's say a barrel of Russian oil is about $100 in the market. So in the market, as per the market forces, it is costing about 100 per barrel. But what has G7 decided? G7 has decided that it will not be 100 as per the market forces, but instead there will be a price cap. What is this price cap? 
This basically means that the fuel or the oil that is sold by Russia should not exceed 60 per barrel. This basically means irrespective of what the price is in the market, this oil should not go beyond 60 rupees. So this basically means the price of the oil can be 100, 110, 120, 130 in the open market. Whatsoever is the price in the market, it will not be provided the same amount. Instead, 60 per barrel is what would be provided for the Russian oil is the price cap. What is the advantage according to the G7? According to the G7, yes, they are selling the oil, they are exporting the oil to multiple countries. So countries can import Russian oil as well. But if 100 rupees is paid, Russia is able to fund its economy. It is also able to invade Ukraine as well. Why? Because it has finances at its disposal. But now if it is kept at 60 per barrel or 50 per barrel or 40 per barrel, that is the price cap beyond which it cannot go. If that is the case, Russia will receive very very less amount of money, its economy would be frozen and it would not be able to invade Ukraine primarily because it has very less resources. It is in this particular backdrop, the G7 countries and European Union came up with this particular idea that they are going to impose what is called as a price cap. So if there is any country which is planning to import Russian oil, in that case, they have to stick to this price cap. This country A should not be buying Russian oil beyond this price cap basically to freeze or impose sanctions on Russia. Another important factor that we also have to consider is, let's say for example, why is that Russia has been imposed with at least a price cap? Why not full sanction on Russia? That is because if Russia does not send in its oil, what it can also cause is recession. We already have couple of Western countries which are already facing the heat of recession. If the oil is not exported by Russia, then this could also spike up oil in multiple other countries as well and multiple other countries will also face the heat of crunch of oil the economy will not work and as a result inflation further increases increasing the idea of recession so why did the west want a price cap western nations led by g7 want to punish russia for having invaded ukraine and drain in the profits accruing to russia from oil exports but they also want to keep some oil from russia flowing globally so that supply is not significantly affected which could push up the energy prices which is the primary reason they have imposed a price cap and at the same time they want the russian oil keep flowing as well how has russia reacted when Whenever there are these impositions, sanctions that have been imposed by the Western countries, you also have the reaction of Russia as well. How has Russia reacted? Russia has gone ahead and said that it might actually produce minimal amount of oil. And if those countries are imposing sanctions and price cap, Russia may not export oil to such countries. Added to it, it has also said what it will come up with is called as the floor price. What is this floor price? The Western countries have come up with what is called as the price cap. Then we have floor price that Russia is planning to come up with. So Russia can come up with a particular price which means to say for a barrel of oil that it is exporting it should not fall below 70 dollar which means if russia is exporting oil it can be anything within the market it can be 100 120 but it should not fall below 70 dollar per barrel which means to say it can be sold at 100 it can be sold at 90 it can be sold at 80 but it should not fall below 70 this is the response of Russia where it said it may cut down on the oil production and even if it is exporting, even if it is exporting and getting the money, it should not be below the floor price which is the minimum price which it wants for its product. Which are the countries which have been the beneficiaries of this issue? We have China and India, which are the energy deficit countries. Both these countries are importing a lot of oil from Russia. We also have France as well, which is also importing and purchasing a lot of oil from Russia. And then 
we also have Saudi Arabia itself which is also procuring a lot of oil from Russia. In fact, Saudi has used this discounted price to buy oil to run its own power plants while it is selling its own costlier variant to the world as well. Now let's look at data given in this article. How much oil does India import from Russia? Interestingly, India whose imports of Russian oil was only about 0.2% of total oil imports in the year ended March 2022 has had Russia serve as its top oil supplier in October and November. So Russia has become one of the leading sources of import of oil for India. Reuters reported that in November, India bought 53% or about 3.7 million tons of all the seaborne Urals crude that Russia exported. How have global oil prices behaved since the cap was announced? A Reuters report quotes Yagni Surov, an economist at Central Credit Bank, as saying that if Russia's oil price fell to 45 to 50 a barrel, that would hit the country's budget. It also cited analysts at Raymond James as putting the economic loss for Russia at about 37 billion over a 12-month period. As per oilprice.com, Ural's crude had touched about $53, compared with about $73 to a barrel on November 8. Ben crude, the global benchmark, had also declined to sub-80 per barrel, which is below the price it recommended before the war started. How much does ship insurance typically cost? Why are we speaking about this ship insurance? That is because the Western countries, the G7 countries, also said that if there is a particular country which is planning to import oil from Russia and that is not at a price cap. Other countries would be able to import but if they are not making use of the price cap, they are paying the market price to Russia. In that case, what would happen? The insurance that is provided for the shipment will not be provided by the western countries. So this basically means whenever there is a shipment. How does the oil move? What you require is huge shipments. So the movement of the ships from source to the destination, it will pick up oil from Russia and from Russia if it has to come to India, all that it has to travel is through the shipments. But what if this particular ship which is carrying the oil has a failure in its mechanism and the oil that is present in the ship falls off. Who will pay for it? It is the insurance companies. So most of these insurance companies who bear the brunt of paying this money are the western countries and there is a premium that has to be paid as well if there is a country which is planning to import Russian oil not at the cost of the price set by the G7 countries. In that case, the insurance that is given by the western countries will not be provided which I ultimately means they have to spend extra for the insurance. So how much does ship insurance typically cost? The cost of insuring a tanker of oil can range widely depending on routes the ship takes and the political atmosphere surrounding those routes at a given time. When oil tankers were attacked in West Asia in 2019, the cost of insurance rose from a few thousand dollars to several hundreds of thousands of dollars. Media reports spec the increased rates at the time between 1,85,000 dollar and five lakh dollar. Now the big question is will it actually impact Russia in reality? No says many of the political thinkers. Why? That is because you have the two major economies of China and India which are importing oil and at the same time if Russia continues to send oil at a discounted price many countries will still procure oil from Russia and at the same time you want a constant feed of oil. And this amount of 60 per barrel that is imposed by the G7 and European countries will not have much impact because the international market is almost at 68 to 70 per barrel as per the international market. So this will not have much of impact on Russia, save many others. So despite the United States led sanctions on Russia, post its invasion of Ukraine, India has decided not just to continue with it, double the trade with Russia in the near foreseeable future. So basically, as of now, this price cap may not have significant impact on Russia is what is this article all about. Now let's look into the next article. 
This article says Forest Department Initiative to Restore Natural Vegetation. Let us try and understand what is this article all about. This article here is speaking about afforestation and invasive species. The Forest Department in association with Neelpula Gram Panchayat in Kerala has launched Varni Karan that is afforestation project to root out invasive plants especially Senna Spectabilis and restore natural forest. There are two things that we have to look at. One is what is this invasive plants or the invasive species. Second is about Senna Spectabilis. What is this invasive species? An invasive species can be an animal. It can also be a plant. It can also be a parasite as well. So when there is a plant or an animal which is not originally present in that particular area, region, country, state, so on and so forth, is introduced into that state. That is what is called as invasive. So it comes to this new place. It takes over this particular place and it is the native species, the animals and plants which become the major sufferer. So what is this invasive species? Those species which are not endemic or originally present in that region, state or country but imported by mistake or for the ornamental purposes or people have bought it or it can be accidentally as well if it is introduced into this new area it will take over that particular area and it is the native species which will start suffering which is called as the invasive species second important factor is with respect to Sinna specta balis what is it this happens to be one of the tree that was initially brought into Kerala for the ornamental purposes so this was brought into Kerala for the ornamental purposes and now it has become an invasive species and taken over even the native ones as well. The native species do not seem to grow underneath this canopy. So the shrubs and other native plants are also being displaced as well while no animals also seem to prefer feeding on the leaves. So originally it was ornamental in nature. Animals are not feeding on the leaves and the shrubs under this particular tree is not able to generate any nutritive value. So this spectabilis is overtaking native tree species of the forestry ecosystem and ultimately the endemic species have become the major sufferers. So what are the concerns in general with respect to the invasive species? Whenever there is an invasive species, it will replace the native breed. The native breed will become the major sufferers. They extract a lot of water. The native breed will not get enough of water and this may result for other species going down over a period of time. Whenever there is an endemic species, you have animals which come up to this particular place. They also feed on the leaves as well. But because this invasive species has taken over, it results in those animals not feeding on them. Ultimately, this animal can also move to a different place as well. In invasive species also create monoculture as well and whenever there is monoculture this can also result in forest fires in that particular area so in order to ensure that all these issues are addressed what they are coming up with is rooting out this invasive species and carrying out the planting of other plants which are endemic to this particular part how is the implementation? They have engaged themselves in afforestation work since the eradication of invasive plants under the supervision of forest officials by utilizing the services of tribal workers under the Mandrega. So they have also been using the Mandrega workers basically to root out the invasive species and also to develop afforestation in this part of the forest. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. Now let's look into the next article. This article says Badri cow breed of Uttarakhand to get a generic boost. Let us try and understand what is this article all about. This article here is speaking about Badri or the Pahari cow. This is a native species. Where is it seen? It is seen in the state of Uttarakhand. So remember the Badri cow is a native species which is present in the state of Uttarakhand. This particular cow grazes in the Himalayas on the native herbs and shrubs and hence 
its milk has high nutritional value so this particular cow does not have plastic it does not feed on other types of grass but because it feeds in the himalayan heartland it also feeds on some of the medicinal plants its milk has high nutritional and medicinal value and this breed is also blessed with strong immunity as well why does it have strong immunity that is because it is feeding on the medicinal plants that are present in the himalayan ecosystem so this breed is comparatively resistant to the disease because of its eating habits and this particular breed is indigenous and is eating on the medicinal herbs and is far away from toxic pollution polyethylene harmful things that cows in the plains are subject to so what is the significance of this breed as the badri cow grazes only on herbs and shrubs available in the mountains its milk has rich medicinal content and high organic value the same is the usp of its produce for which its ghee is quite expensive its urine has a high value due to its feeding and habitat the lactation milk yield ranges from 547 kg to 657 kg with an average milk fat content of 4% so what is the present context to increase the productivity of its indigenous badri cow which grazes on herbs that grow in the himalayas uttarakhand is now planning for its genetic enhancement so we have the bureaucrats and officials from the animal husbandry department who proposed to use sex sorted semen technology to improve the stock of the petite badri cattle officials have proposed to opt for the embryo transfer method to produce more cattle of a high genetic stock it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article but the key important factor from this article is that we have badri cow which is from the state of uttarakhand now let's look into the next article this article says parliament must examine issue of age of consent we have the chief justice of india dy chandrachud who has appealed to the parliament to have a relook at the issue of age of consent under the protection of children from sexual offences act as it proposed difficulties for judges examining cases of consensual sexual intercourse between two adolescents what is this article speaking about it is speaking about statutory rape what is the statutory rape let's say for example there is a boy and a girl who are less than 18 years of age so these two people have engaged in a physical relationship they do engage in sexual activity but we know for the fact that anyone who is engaging in a sexual activity who is less than 18 years of age will be assumed as rape and such person will be penalized as per the pocso act so if there is a girl who is less than 18 years of age has consented has given permission to a boy who is less than 18 years of age these two people engage in sexual activity but then since they are less than 18 years of age the boy can be booked as per the provisions of pocso so this article currently goes on to say that we have the chief justice of india who is asking the government the legislature to look into this particular provision where if there is a girl and a boy who is less than 18 years of age above 16 years if they have consented and if they have given permission to each other engaged in sexual activity that should not be treated as rape under the present statutory rape if there is any person who is less than 18 years of age even if they have given the consent that will be assumed as rape so there is a recommendation that is being made that if they are above 16 less than 18 and if there is consent that should be assumed as rape or not is what the government will have to look into is one of the recommendations made by the chief justice of india that is chandrachud why is this coming into picture that is because we recently have number of acquittals that have been made by the madras high court and couple of other high courts as well we have one of the landmark judgment that is also delivered by the madras high court in vijay lakshmi was a state trip the inspector of police where the madras high court questioned the wisdom of criminalizing such acts in sabari was his inspector of police to madras high court recommended the age of consent be revised to about 16 years 
So this article currently goes on to say that there have been couple of other studies which have also taken place where as much as 93% have led to acquittals in the high court and at the same time when you consider the trial process it takes about 1.4 to 2.3 years and during this period it is the boy who becomes the major sufferer so looking into these things whether they should be changing the law is what the government will have to introspect so this article currently goes on to say that we have to decriminalize consensual sexual acts involving adolescents above the age of 16 while ensuring that those above 16 and below 18 continue to be protected against non consensual acts under the poxo and at the same time there has to be an introduction of sexuality education to all adolescents is what is this article all about now let's look into the next article this article here is important in terms of the jail reforms whenever we speak about people going to the jails what we have to look at is these people at times may have committed an act in a fit of a rage they wouldn't want to commit such an act of criminal in nature but in a fit of rage or in any passion or in other issues they would have committed this activity so we have a reformative system so in order to reform them and at the same time provide a skill set so that while they are in jail they also acquire the skill and once they are out of the jail they would be able to make a living out of the skill what we have is a tihar jail where people are trained with the skill set which is called as the products of the tihar hut so tihar hut is a store run by the inmates of the central tihar jail since 1961 they are famous for its cupcakes, stationery and handicraft products and this could soon be available online says this article. Basically, there are a couple of products such as handloom, baked goods, carpentry, jute bags, herbal color, spices, blanket, stitching, candle making, undergarments, all of these are the products of this Tihar hut. So in the near future, it is not only about offline but they will be coming on online and people would be able to purchase this is one of the examples for the jail reforms so they are not only reformed they are also given the skill set so once they are out of the jail they would be able to make a living out of it is one such example where it can act as a fodder for you to give in your mates exam as part of the jail reforms now let's look into the mains practice question with the race in instances of tension between state governments and governors discuss the role and conduct of governors and examine whether chief ministers should have a say in the appointment of governors in their respective states what is russia oil price cap will it have an impact on russia and india critically analyze so please write all your answers on the comment section peer review and do give positive feedback to your friends answers if you wish you can also visit our website as well put in the images of your answers and also discuss with your pals this is it for today thank you for watching all the best